Turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6. I'm going to read verse 12, and then I'm going to read a verse in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Boy, my eyesight's getting numb. Just hold on with me. I didn't mark this. Let me get to it. Hebrews 12 and 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doeth easily, so easily beset us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. The title of the message that I want to preach on this morning is this. This is for this side. Let go. There's some people that need to let go of some things. I got something for you. And a few more. Just hold on. And if you know what, if you don't like that title, I got another title. This is for you. Hold on. Just let go. Amen. This morning when I think about these two passages of Scripture from, from where we've taken our text, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12, and Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1, my thoughts take me back to some of the altar services that we used to experience around the altar at my home church, at the Williamston First Pentecostal Holiness Church. It used to be when a soul came to the altar seeking a deeper relationship with God, that the prayer warriors would surround that seeking soul and will not particularly let them go until there was victory. The pianist would be playing while the size of the congregation would begin to dwindle and become less and less. But the crowd that was there that was left, they would be singing songs like, I would not be denied. When pains of death ceased on my soul, until the Lord I cried, till Jesus came and made me hold, I would not be denied. I would not be denied. I would not be denied till Jesus came and made me whole. I would not be denied. If you look at, that was just the first verse in its course. But if you look at the other verses, it sounds like to me that this song was inspired by Genesis 32 and 26. How many remembers when the angel appears and Jacob is called back home? And here's what the angel is going to say. And he said, let me go. For the day breaketh and he said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. You know what, though the congregation may not be that large in number this morning, I got to believe that there are people in here seeking souls that need something from the Lord. Amen. And wouldn't it be nice if there, we, we will make our minds up when we come to this altar that we are not going to be denied until Jesus comes and makes us whole. We're not leaving, Lord, 
till you bless us, until you meet our needs. Just, just food for thought. I will not be denied if you look in your hymn books. Page 238 was written by Charles P. Jones. And it was written around 1900. And just in case you don't know who Charles P. Jones was, he was an African-American minister. He was a founder of one of the large black holiness denominations of his time. You didn't know that, did you? You know it now. Well, how about this? Deeper, deeper in the love of Jesus, written by Oswald J. Smith in 1915. Deeper, deeper in the love of Jesus, daily let me go. Higher, higher in the school of wisdom, more of grace to know. Oh, deeper yet I pray, and higher every day, and wiser, blessed Lord, in thy precious holy word. Around the altar, while the piano was playing, and the piano was filling the air. Around the altar, while some of the saints were singing these songs, I will not be denied. And deeper in the love of Jesus or some other appropriate song around the altar while the prayer warriors were praying and the seeking soul was seeking God. It wouldn't be long before one of the saints of God would whisper to that soul seeking ear, just let go. Just let go. And then while the prayers and the songs would continue, and the, play, the piano player kept playing the pianist, another one later would come back and say, Just hold on. Just let go. Just hold on. You know what, in recent days, I've heard people laugh about that, about that past. Just let go and just hold on. Sounds like a, sounds like a contradictory sayings, don't it? You got one saying let go. You got one saying hold on. But you know, within the last couple, two or three days, and look at this sermon, it dawned on me how scripture, how Bible-based, and how Bible-backed what they were saying was and is still true. Perhaps, Orman, perhaps maybe just maybe this, could that saint who was saying, just let go, could they have maybe been echoing the words that were written in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1? Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with such a great a cloud of witnesses. You know what? We are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses by heaven looking down on us. But in our churches and around our altars, when we have our altar service, I believe that we are also still surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. Wherefore, seeing we also compassed about with such great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight is that not what the writer of Hebrews is telling us? In other words, you got some, something in your life and you just need to let it go and you need to lay it aside. What are these things? And here's what he said, lay down every weight and the sin which to us easily so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Is that not scripture? Or perhaps... Or just maybe, on the other hand, when that saint is whispering in their ear, just hold on. Could they not have been echoing the words that were written in 1 Timothy 6 and 12? 
Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on to eternal life, whereunto thou art called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Could it be that the writer of Hebrews and the writer of the Timothy and the saints of old that were saying, just let go and just hold on, could it not be that they were all right? It's time to break out the amen cards. You see, y'all, there's some things that we just need to let go of. Is anybody interested in hearing? After you hear them, you may not want to hear them. Hebrews 12 and 1. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which do so easily beset us. Lay aside your sin. Lay aside your weights. And I tell you what, let's do. Let's just, just go ahead and let's just start with sin. If God hates some things, and there's some things that are abomination in the sight of God, don't you think that we need to let go of those things? Don't you think that we just need to lay those things aside? Sure we do. And sure you do. In Proverbs 6 and 16, these six things doeth the Lord hate. Yea, and seven are an abomination unto him. Proverbs 6 and 17 at the very beginning. A proud look. Boy, we got our work cut out for us this morning. A proud look. I need to stop and preach a little while this morning. Has it become that we are just too proud for God to bless us? I want to, I want to remind you what we used to be called. I want you to remind you what we have been tagged, us holiness folks. We used to be laughed at, mocked at, made fun. We were called holy rollers. You know what? I wish it'd get back to the place again that we could be tagged and we could be named holy rollers. And it used to be, and, and I don't know what it is now, but the women would allow God to bless them and they didn't, their pride was gone. And they didn't mind the Spirit of God coming upon them. And you know what? Even shaking the hairpins out of their hair on the floor. Has it become that we are too proud now? that we're not going to do those things? We're not going to say that. We're not going to do that. We're not going to act like that. You know what your forefathers did and our foremothers. But you know what? One thing that God hates is pride. And you know what we need to do? We need to lay our pride aside. I want to tell you what the Bible says about pride. We might be here for a, long, a little while this morning, but my pork chops are thin. In a Psalm of David, in Psalm 138 and 6, Though the Lord be high, yet he has respect unto the lowly. But the proud he knoweth afar off. How about this in the very middle of 17 in chapter 6? Not only a proud look, but a lying tongue. A Psalm of David again. How many remember Psalm 51? You know what that deals with? That deals with David's sin with Bathsheba and being approached by that of the prophet. 
And here's what, here's what David said. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt thou shall make me to know wisdom. We need to lay down our pride. We need to lay down a lying tongue. How about this in 17, the latter part of that verse, hands that shed innocent blood. Just let go. And let's just put this in just simple, simple four words, the sixth commandment. Exodus 20 and 13, thou shalt not kill. Do you know what? We have become a society and we have become a nation that is shedding hands, that is shedding innocent blood. It gets no more innocent than a baby in a mother's womb or one that has been carried for nine months and been laid on a table and then their life has been snuffed out from them. And then in verse 18, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Too many of us just allow our imagination and our mind and our heart just, just run rapid. That we think so many things. But I remember back in my home church again, we used to have lifeliners on Sunday night before the evening service. And you know what we close with? We close with Psalms 19 and 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. How about this in 18, in the middle of 18? Feet that be swift in running to mischief. Second Timothy 2 and 4. No man that warth entangled himself with the affairs of this life. Do you know what? There are too many people that are too much busy bodies in everybody else's business. Deborah, will you give me an amen? Amen. amen. I've seen people that couldn't take care of their own business, let alone somebody else's business. And how about this? A false witness that speaketh lies. Just let go. Ephesians 4 and 25. Wherefore putting away lying, speak every man the truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. And how about this last one? He that soweth discord among brethren, just let it go. Matthew 5 and 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Anybody like to hear those again? We just need to lay aside and let go of a proud look. We just need to let go of a lying tongue. We just need to let go hands that shed innocent blood. We just need to let go a heart that deviseth mischief imaginations. We just need to let go of feet that be swift and running to death of mischief. We just need to let go of a false witness that speaketh lies. And we need to just let go of death of sowing discord among brethren. That's sin. But then there are weights. He says, lay aside. Let us lay aside every weight. Do you know what weights are? They're not necessarily sin. But are things that bog us down and pull at our spirits so much that we don't have any joy or any peace. Colton Jansen wrote an article entitled, Ten Things That Can Distract Us From God. Anybody like to know what they are? Money. Money! Not necessarily that you have made money your God. Not so much as you've got the love of money in your heart and spirit. 
Did you know a couple of things that are the biggest things in separation and divorce these days? You knew probably what one of them is, right? Well, we're going to skip that one. But the other is money. I might as well say it. We all are pretty much adults. Sex and money. We can have so much of our mind and our heart on money that we don't trust God like we should. Where's the money going to come from? Can I tell you if God so clothes this earth with grass? Can I tell you if God feeds a little sparrow? Can I tell you if God causes the sun to rise, to shine, and set? How much more important are you than a little sparrow? But some people's just not money. Some of you better hold on on this one. This, some of you, is media. And you know what that is? That's TV. And news. That's, I'm just telling you what this cat said. Boy, cat, I ain't said that in a while. There, there's money. There's the media. And listen to this. Church. The third one is church and religion. We can be so wrapped up in religious things that we forget the most important thing, and that's having a relationship with God. Oh, you be preacher, that's possible. Uh, you better believe it's possible. If you don't, read the book of Revelation chapter 3 and read about the church of Laodicea that, you know what, Jesus is on the outside and the church continues to go and to function even without the Lord. If it can happen in a church, in a body, it can happen in our hearts and our lives. The religion and the church has crowded us out and has become a weight. And then there are relationships. But I want to get to the next one. And it's called routine. You know what one of the hardest things to do is? Is get people to change. Thank you, Deborah. Is to change. Because of the way that we've always done things. And I'm going to tell you one thing, if we want to keep in the routine and ain't willing to change, not only have we lost a generation or two in the past, we're going to lose a generation or two in the future. Routine. It can become a weight. Ain't you glad I got over the first seven? You, you, you amen a little bit better now. How about our work? How about hobbies? How about desiring a blessing from God rather than to have a relationship with God? And I'm getting ready to floor you what I'm about to say. How about the pastor? Deborah's daddy used to go and preach some revivals and he went to one church. A particular time, and every time he got up ready to preach, the man fell asleep. You, none of us sleep in church, right? Y'all burn it sleep, y'all too close to the front row. <laughs> but R.T. later on asked the man, why do you sleep in church? And you know what he said? Because I trust your preaching. And what I'm trying to say, y'all, is you can't, you can't just... Just re rely on a pastor for so much of your spiritual life. Amen. There's some things that you have got to do. I'm going to give you the truth, but I want you to look and make sure you can find it, see if it ain't the truth. I'm going to preach to you, but you know what? We got to pray and we got to draw closer to God ourselves. This is a personal, individual thing. But too many people rely on the preacher, on the pastor. That's what he says, and I, I kind of believe it. And then point blank, we ourselves, 
There's money, there's media, there's church slash religion, there's relationships, there's routine, there's our work, hobbies, desiring a blessing from God rather than to have a relationship with God. There's the pastor, there's ourselves. These are weights. Boy, you're going to get a lot of information today. And you know what, y'all? This is things that we need to let go. And when Preston they were whispering around the altar to that seeking soul, just let go. Don't you think that's what they were saying? Lay aside the sins and the weights and the weights and the sins that will easily beset us and let us run this race with patience. Let these things go. Get free. Get your joy. Get your peace. Get your relationship with God. But then again, there's some things that while we're letting go, we've got to just hold on to. Anybody interested? We better get a hold of love and we better hold it real tight. My dad used to tell me, who was very undereducated, couldn't hardly spell, spell his name, but just a little bit, couldn't write. He used to tell me, Ronnie, if you got, if you got love, you're going to be all right. And you know what, y'all? We better get a hold of love, and we better hold on to love. Because love is of God. In Genesis 1 and 26, and God says, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air, over the cattle and over all the earth and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And then jump to 1 John 4 and 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Don't you think that when God created that of man in his image and after his likeness, press and Norman, if God is love and love is God, that God made us creatures, amen? He made us as human beings that he put something as far as in our soul, in our heart, in our spirit, that you know what? We want to love others and we won't love in return. And if you wonder why love is so important in our lives, because it's the answer that satisfies the emotional needs of human beings. And human beings have a quality of giving and feeling love. It is related to our biological structure in creation. You see, love is the fulfilling of the law in Romans 13 and 8. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For for it says this, he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. And that's not all. Not only is it the fulfillment of the law, but it is the greatest gift. 1 Corinthians 13 and 13, and now by the faith, hope, charity, which is love, these three, but the greatest of these is charity or love. It's because love is the beginning of the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5 and 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and faith. Verse 23, meekness, temperance against such there's no, no law. You better get rid rid of all these other things and you better get a hold of love. And then there's something else. We better just, just hold on to faith. Faith is just as important as the air that we breathe. While the oxygen in the air nourishes the body faith nourishes the heart and soul I need to put this in because the Lord gave me this thought while I was praying a while ago better hold on ain't it amazing that we can look around us and about us Y'all, I was getting very concerned about how dry it was. 
Eight years ago, the farmers in certain areas had to dish their corn up because of a lack of moisture. Driving back and forth from the home to the church, to the hospital, to the hospital, to the church and home. I began to look how dry it was in the fields and how dusty it was in the fields and how the corn was starting to twist and starting to wither. And, and I said, God, we, we need rain. Lord, we need rain. And so we talked about it Wednesday night in our, in our, in our Bible class. Lord, we need rain. Lord, we need rain. And we're praying for rain. And we got a shower Thursday, a couple of showers. And Friday night, boy, the storms came. S.A. was some, somewhere hiding in a restaurant, and I was on my front porch. <laughs> That's what S.A. told me. S.A., this is true. Never tell you. The wind was blowing. It was raining like crazy. And I was saying, thank you, Lord. Lord, just watch over my wife. And Lord, just watch over my son. And Lord, watch over my son. And Lord, watch over me. And matter of fact, the things, Lord, that you have allowed me to use down here that's yours because I'm called in stewardship. Would you please watch over those things as well? S.L. was in a restaurant. I was on the front porch, trusting God. Amen. Well, he was in a restaurant, trusting God. But you know what the Lord kind of put in my spirit a while ago? Why is it that we can discern around about us sometimes about things, how dry things are, but spiritually speaking, But spiritually speaking, we can't see how dry things are around us spiritually and how much we need rain and how next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday and Chris, how we need the latter rain to fall down upon us. Y'all, that's what we need in church. And I'm not finished, okay? I'm not finished. But that's food for thought. And you think on these things, Selah. That's what the psalmist says. But faith, we better hold on to faith. You know why? Because faith pleases God. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Abel had a justifying faith. Enoch had a sanctifying faith. Noah had a separating faith. Abraham had an obedient faith. Isaac had a patient faith. And Jacob had a suffering faith. And she don't have it. Joy, you don't have it. But Joseph had a victorious faith. And you see, we are saved by faith in Ephesians 2 and 8. For by grace are you saved through faith. And not in yourselves, it is the gift of death of God. Because we walk by faith, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Because faith helps us to find our purpose in life. And joy don't have what I'm about to say neither. You better get rid of some things and you better hold on to some things. And I want to put this in. You better be true to your calling, what God has called you to do. Because the callings of God are without repentance. You need to be faithful to God and you need to be faithful to God until the very end. How many in this service gets discouraged? Come on. How many gets discouraged? You need to be faithful to God and you need to be faithful to God until the very end. And I'm going to tell you why. Because somebody is waiting for you to show them the way. And that ain't all. We've come too far to turn back now. And that ain't all. There's a crown waiting for us on the other side. You better hold on to love. And you better hold on to faith. Anybody want to hear anything else? You better hold on to the truth. Jesus is brought before Pilate. And Pilate asks Jesus in John 8 and 18 and 38 this question. Pilate said it to him, what is truth? 
Ain't it amazing sometimes we cannot see things that's at the tip of our nose and stands right before us. Pilate says, what is truth? Omen, truth is standing right before him. But he's blind and he cannot see. He's a Gentile, but you know what? That's an excuse, but maybe it's not an excuse enough. But how about this? Jesus is going to rebuke the scribes and the Pharisees. They are Jews. They know the law. But here's what the Lord says to, about them in Matthew 15, 14 to his disciples. Let them alone. They be blind, leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. You're an education man, right, Billy? You've been on the boards and all this. How about this? This is in the apostasy that's predicted by Timothy in 2 Timothy 3 and 7. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So, uh, Solomon gives out a warning and instruction. In Proverbs 23 and 23, buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. In the witness of John the Baptist in John 1 and 17, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. In the discourse after the feast, Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus said this in John 8 and 32, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And Jesus in the Passover chamber speaks these words in 6 of chapter 14. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Some of you are sitting back and you're kind of like me. You're kind of wondering what in the world has happened to our nation. What in the world has happened to our leaders? Well, when you do away with the Bible, you do away with prayer you're in spiritual darkness and blindness. That we got people that don't have any idea what the truth is. You better hold on to love. You better hold on to faith. You better hold on to truth. And of course, you know where I'm going with this. You just better hold on to Jesus. And I got news for you, Lee. When you can't feel like you got the strength to hold on, he'll hold on to you. You want to know why you hold on to Jesus? Because he is the Son of God. In Gabriel's annunciation, boy, Joy's getting fast these days. She's getting faster than my tongue can go. In the virgin birth. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Hold on to Jesus, because he is the Son of God. Not only is he the Son of God, but he is the Savior of the world. Nobody knew Jesus better than that of John. That of John the Beloved and later would be that of John the Divine. He was the one that leaned on the chest of that of Jesus and Jesus spoke to him. But here's what he said in 1 John 4 and 14. We have seen and do testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Not only is he the Son of God, not only is he the Savior of the world, but he is the Lamb of God. In the witness of John the Baptist in John 1, 29, next day John saith Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. And you know what? He is our advocate when we sin. He, he is my little children in 1 John 2 and 1. These things write unto you, that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the perpetuation for our sins, and not for ours only, 
but also for the sins of the whole world. And there's something else. He's our soon coming king. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. I thought about this the other day. My kids, the boys in particular, what, what's that group that they like, the, 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 the movies they like? The Avengers. And there was this cruel guy in one of the Avengers. And he's a bad guy. And at the snap of a finger, not this is true, at the snap of a finger, I mean, this part ain't true, this is Hollywood. But at the snap of a finger, he gets rid of about half the population. And seriously, I, here's the part that's true. I thought about it the other day. I said, God, why don't you just take some of these bad people out? You can do it at a snap of a finger. Seriously. And there were certain political people that begin to roll over. You remember I told you about your imagination, your mind wondering, mom was wondering why. I said, Lord, why don't you take her out? And then take the other her out. And won't you just take him out? And all these bad people. And Billy, you know what the Lord said to me? Ronnie, I ain't taking the bad people out. I'm taking the good. Come on, y'all. Don't just stir you up a little bit. So if you want to snap your finger, and take the bad people out, don't worry. The Lord's going to sound a trumpet, and he's going to take the good people out. Amen. That's worth an amen right there. Amen. That's worth an amen. amen. President, he's going to take the good people amen. out. Why don't y'all just let Why don't y'all just hold on? Oh, excuse me. Why don't y'all just hold on? Why don't y'all just let, let go? How many has enjoyed being in the house of the Lord? Won't you stand, please?